Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we appreciate you coming to the panel today. Um, we do have some questions we're going to kind of pose to the panelists, but we really want it to be interactive. So I might start out with one or two questions, but I'm hoping we get a lot of participation from the audience because everybody's here because they want to find out what this group's thoughts are on certain topics in the industry. So um, please feel free to raise your hand. Or we're not going to wait till the end. We'll just do it throughout. All right. All right, well, thank you guys. We really appreciate uh, these four people are folks that you will frequently see their name associated uh, with containers, cloud, uh, PaaS, everything related to the industry. So questions along that nature um, definitely apply. And if there's any other topics you feel like are related that I might not mention or we might not be talking about, bring them up. And if we can't answer the question, we'll, we'll note it and find someone who can. I'm very confident with this four, this group of four people that will find someone to answer your question. So um, the first question I wanted to ask you, um, and I, even though I'm from Docker, I'll try to be very unbiased in my question, so feel free to ask. Um, based on everything you've seen at the show today, what is it telling you um, kind of where the container industry is going? Like, where do you see it today, and, and where do you see it in the next, over the course of 2017 and beyond? Uh, straight and to the right. <laughs> uh, no, it's the, the long hockey tail up. Uh, we're already in the, uh, in the uh, rapid adoption phase. There's lots of vendors. Uh, customers this morning, it's always interesting to see people talk about that. I'm still personally waiting uh, for the doom and gloom, uh, the negative stories, and we'll get to that after, because we're now in the happy phase. But generally, uh, everything is good. On the spot, I forgot that question. <laughs> uh, well, okay. Well, one thing that comes to mind: uh, Oracle even made an announcement about an acquisition this week in in the way of microservices. So, I think we're going to be seeing more microservice frameworks and tools coming out. That's just going to help carry this wave of what we're seeing people do as far as moving their apps to containers and then being able to carry that further with microservices. So that's one observation. Yeah, I think. The biggest surprise for me out of what I've seen here, um, besides Docker announcements, is, is really the lack of surprise, I think. Um, you know, walking down around the show floor, you see basically every vendor you would expect to see and very few you wouldn't expect to see. Um, I think there was only, you know, one vendor I ran into that I hadn't come across before and, you know, maybe one larger one that was a little bit of a surprise to see here. Um, and so, you know, things seem like they're just kind of trucking along at the moment and, um, you know, not a whole lot of disruption, at least present at this show. Maybe they're somewhere else. One thing I wanted to add to what you said before about you know and there being no real uh, you know trial just yet is that I think some of that has already come and gone, but that doesn't mean it's gone for good, because previously uh, a lot of the difficulties that people were having were containers with the fact that the the space was moving so quickly, and a lot of people were getting frustrated and feeling left behind because they were trying to actually build infrastructure with these things, and then six months later the stuff they'd built would be subtly broken in some way because things just kept moving forward. Um, and that's that's eased off a little bit, thank goodness. But I my, I have my fingers crossed behind my back about that. Is that you know this could pop back up again in another form, and people are going to get twice as angry. Well, well I guess something that uh, oh, Sean, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I, was, I was just going to say now that I think about it, uh, talking about that early adoption because people make their bets, uh, and then they have to make your bet and lie in it kind of thing. Um, so I think people who made their bets early on Swarm or Kubernetes or whatever is the orchestration, and then they figure out that they have to move, that's probably where. To talk to your point. Because once once you move in, you kind of adopt it, which is why uh, the Docker runtime, I know people were talking here about Container D and OCI. Essentially, it's Docker with some added specifications and magic. The um, App C, which is, what is it, the uh, application image, inf uh, the image format specification is essentially Docker V2 format. So all these things are... Uh, Docker is a function of being the de facto standard becoming the standard, so uh, we'll see. I think I think the barrier is going to be when people try and change or shift. Um, and then, Donnie, you mentioned um, you weren't surprised to see uh, people here. I was surprised to see CoreOS because uh, I didn't expect to see them. Uh, but I think it's great that they're here because uh, CoreOS is a rival in every shape of the form, every word, every shape, everything. Rocket versus uh, versus uh, Container D and everything. Everybody's friendly at a conference, but uh, you see as many uh, mailing lists as I do, and things are different there. Well, just kind of building off, because we're talking about ecosystem now, and building off something Donnie said, um, 
beyond Docker, you know, where are you seeing growth across the ecosystem? Like what other types of companies? I know, Sirdar, you had a thought on that and what other companies are kind of sprouting up around Docker? Well, the really interesting stuff that I've seen is with people who are, let me actually back up for a second. One of the things about Docker that's always been interesting is that it's just made up of pieces that have always been in the Linux kernel. They're just packaged together in a new form and they're productized. And some people have laughed at this. Oh, look, I can reproduce this in 200 lines of bash. But you know, the point is that they were able to, they were able to productize it in a way that was convenient for others. And I'm now noticing other people working on similar things. They're they're taking stuff that already exists in the kernel that has already existed for a long time, and making companion items out of those things for Docker. Like for instance, there is a project I covered the other week called Cilium. Um, what they do is they basically take the Berkeley packet filtering components that are in the Linux kernel, and they make that into um, a network add-on, uh, network processing for, for containers and also for Kubernetes pods. And I thought, that's brilliant. You know, you work with what's already there and what people already understand. And I think there's, that's a huge, uh, there's a huge amount of untapped potential there. Yeah, I guess from my perspective, um, you know, some of the shifts in the ecosystem are, you know, step one was, can we run an app in a container? Step two was, can we do microservices across multiple containers? And step three is, can we run like traditional enterprise apps um, in containers? And so, you know, the ecosystem has kind of evolved to support that, right? First, we had things like networking, um, and now we're getting into things like uh, backup and DR and storage and all that kind of stuff for people who are still using, um, you know, not using stateless approaches and who want to run, you know, their Oracle or their SAP or something like that in a container. Um, so that, that seems to be, you know, the way things are evolving. And then um, you'll probably have something to say about microservice frameworks, so I'm not going to steal your thunder on that. <laughs> no, actually, that was a good lead in, so I didn't have to cover that. But actually, I think now the next step, what I'm hearing is, um, is the whole, okay, great, we did everything in containers, and now how do we take it to production? And this is something, um, as I've attended these kind of conferences, not just DockerCon, but others, and I'll go to container sessions, and I see a lot of ops guys sitting there like, yeah, containers are great, but they're just still having that disconnect between taking it into production. And so, you know, how do these guys provision um, the containers the way they, they do VMs? Because production technologies made is made for VMs and not containers so um, sorry back to your question though so I think that that key, leaves opportunity for some pure plays um, you know maybe companies like a, a rancher uh, labs or, or some that, that want to do even more management they don't want to displace a kubernetes but maybe they want to fill in on some of those management but that's something we're going to need to see the big players um, because that disconnect is still there uh, I expect to see continued growth uh, amongst uh, security vendors because there is tremendous amount of fear, uncertainty, and doubt in security. That's what fuels the business. Uh, so Docker does a fantastic job. Big fan of the way Docker handles security. Uh, but talking to Surter's point about uh, everything coming from Linux, uh, one of the amazing things, one of the things I've learned uh, actually today, was how many uh, recent security vulnerabilities that were discovered in the context of containers were then then had to be fixed upstream in the Linux kernel because of the way that the process forking works and all kinds of other things which we're not going to get into in this type of session. Um, there are older vulnerabilities in Linux that may be five, ten years old or otherwise that people are now discovering. Um, as people adopt things, that's when the penetration testers, security researchers, and others try and see these things. Uh, and when I look at uh, startup capital uh, types of things, um, especially now because I'm aware of all kinds of people submitting talks for final acceptance for DEF CON, which is July, August. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis from early stage uh, venture cap people, seed round uh, and very early angel round into security startups looking specifically at uh, previously unknown security issues with containers. That actually uh, brings up an interesting question because, you know, we hear there's containers, we're talking about production and what's required to bring containers in production. People talk about orchestration, that was kind of the next wave of things. Other people are saying the way, the next wave will be security, storage, those areas. What is uh, this group's opinion on what you think is coming next? What's layered on top of containers? Uh, stateless containers, uh, or rather stateful containers, I think is... Uh, an issue that others can probably speak to on this panel more than I can, but that's a huge issue I hear about from everybody and their brother. People will talk about running 
uh, MySQL, Oracle, and Containers, Oracle talk this morning. I'd like to see how many people run full-scale, 5.9 production, uh, OLAP-type uh, databases, transaction databases at scale uh, for long periods of time uh, in containers in a stateful way. I think that'll be an interesting challenge, but we'll see. Yeah, um, I think, you know, one of the things that's been happening a lot over the past um, year in particular has been, you know, more and more interest in uh, serverless options that you can run on-prem or in any, you know, any venue of your choosing, right? And so there's now, I think, four, somewhere between four and six different open source ones that run on top of containment orchestration platforms. Um, I hate to say the Kubernetes word in here, uh, but most of them recently tend to run on that. Um, before that, you know, that would have been on top of Mesos. So you got stuff like Funkatron that'll run on any of them, right? Take your pick. Um, and so that, you know, serverless idea is something that there's going to be a lot of development in that ecosystem, I think, over the next few years as more and more people start to pick that up for, you know, things that aren't just toys. The word that came to mind when I, I thought about this was uh, invisibility. And by that I mean that you don't know or care that you have a container running. You don't have to worry or think about whether or not storage has to be attached for it because it's just going to be done invisibly and naturally. You don't have to worry about any of the networking that goes on and around it. And that has, that has been a constant headache ever since containers uh, first came into the picture. It was people fussing with uh, the way network can't work. So, you know, my thought was we're getting, the, the point that we really want to reach with this is all of the little fiddly bits that we used to have to kick into shape to get this stuff running are just going to vanish, and we're not even going to be thinking about the fact we have a container anymore. That, to me, is the real next step. Yeah, I, I agree. I would just say, really, anywhere in the entire um, application lifecycle for containers, you know, anywhere there are gaps, and there are definitely gaps, you know, we could all talk about um, those all are going to need to be filled. That's really what's next so that, yeah, everything looks invisible, everything works well together. DevOps really is a, a real word. So, um, yeah, I think app life cycle. I'll, I'll say one more thing. Yeah. Um, since you haven't talked about microservices frameworks yet, um, I will. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, the, the direction that things are going is like all the early adopters have been picking up containers and stuff, and they are all have tons of a tech expertise in-house. They all know how to, like, build it all themselves. But what, like, real companies need is they don't have tons of time to dedicate to like researching what's the latest and greatest cool new thing and like piece it all together and so they're looking for something that's like a complete um, a puzzle or the way I talk about it is like a Lego castle right like people a lot of people don't want one that's glued together right like the Lego movie they also don't want to be handed like a drawer full of pieces they want to get like a castle that they can kind of just start doing stuff with um, you know start flying their people through or whatever and be able to mix and match pieces as they need to. And so these microservices frameworks, right, like um, Apollo and Mantle and Amalgamate and Fabricate um, and, and some others have emerged to basically say, look, orchestration is not enough. Um, you need to have like logging, you need an APM, you need tracing, you need um, secret management, you know, you need all kinds of other things that you don't necessarily get out of the box with containers alone or even with container management alone. Um, and so that is a uh, you know, place where I'm expecting to see a lot of development over the next couple of years too. But let, let me let me ask dig into that a little bit further because like Docker we we're putting our platform together and you know you mentioned secrets all of those are really hard pieces right they they take a level of expertise so are you saying that one you're these companies you're talking about you expect one platform or other ecosystem contributions to those types of platforms? No, I think um, you know the the idea of like everybody you know you just buy like all blue or all red. Um, you know, from IBM or Oracle, is doesn't generally happen anymore. No. And so all the platforms are um, a mix and match of sort of best of breed solutions in a lot of cases. Or, you know, maybe they'll just kind of suck it up from one vendor if uh, it's, it's good enough because it doesn't make things more complex than they already are. Um, but it's more about uh, the solution architecture and, like, things like um, DevOps Express, for example, you know, of all these vendors are going to work together to give you something that actually functions um, as something that's more than like a PowerPoint diagram of a reference architecture, which has been the classic approach, but something you can actually take and start using effectively. I mean, it's, it's not going to be like all Red Hat or all Docker or all anybody, um, but you know, people will want to be able to buy it all from one vendor, and that vendor kind of you know sends the payment through so that it doesn't make procurement complicated. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. No. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Definitely, you know, the, the leading vendors are, uh, and also Oracle, I think Oracle announced 
Photon or the newest version. I actually thought it was finally GA'd, but um, and IBM's got a microservices builder, so and everybody's got something. So yeah, you you can still get these technologies from from the vendor, um, and 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 there's going to be a big push. I mean, VMware. I'm sorry, I think I said Oracle. It was actually VMware, VMware Photon. Yeah. Photon, yeah. Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like, did um, they do a partnership this but, morning? But I, I mean, they, yeah. they, you know, they've got big plans from their OpenStack guys all the way up to the PaaS middleware folks, um, you know, to fill in all those gaps. And it's actually somewhat of a cohesive story because mostly I'm not hearing cohesive stories among these large vendors. They're kind of muddled. And by that, I just mean... I don't see the OpenStack guys talking to the PaaS guys, you know, at all, um, because this stuff still has to work together, and I don't believe it does. But um, yeah, definitely, these these things will are being filled in by the major leaders. Yeah, I was just going to say that whenever I talk to uh, vendors uh, and other folks, usually the word container is synonymous with microservices, uh, and what you're explaining uh, with a microservices framework is something that I uh, almost never, ever, ever hear about. Usually it's just, okay, we're going to use Docker Compose and a YAML file to put it together, uh, and that's how it'll be structured. So I think that's an opportunity, but uh, from where I sit on uh, just as uh, media, I don't get as many briefings as you do perhaps, I haven't heard, and it's always, certainly on the marketing side, it's always a confusion. It's the two words are the same, but I think, I think there may be a, a need in the market, whether it's... Uh, an analyst firm or otherwise, uh, that defines uh, that there is a difference because there's not going to be a NIST definition for microservices, or maybe there should be. You know, there's a NIST definition for cloud, but nobody kind of follows it, but I don't know. I'm aware that there is one, but I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> well, I mean, Charlotte, you, what you're talking about, oh, I think we have a question. Can you, um, Gabriel? Oh. Yeah, so one of the interesting trends I saw this year is that there's a lot of love for the Microsoft ecosystem from Docker, but when you walk the show floor and you ask around, around, uh, do you support any Microsoft kind of technologies, uh, the answer is always uh, Microsoft. Uh, is that still a thing or something like that? So how do you see the adoption of like Docker in such an adjacent uh, community? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think the Windows community has lagged behind for a long time, not just with containers, but with sort of DevOps as a whole. Um, and it's been catching up over the past few years with like, you know, DSC, um, with Nano Server, and, you know, more recently with some of the news um, coming out of the show. And it, it's still, though, from a community perspective, it's very distinct from uh, most of the Docker community. And so, you know, I fully expect to see a very different world um, that's also very interested in Docker when I'm at Microsoft Build in a few weeks. Right? But it'll, it'll be you know, the core Windows dev folks who just love um, C Sharp and F Sharp day in and day out. Um, instead of here, uh, you know, I was in the DockerCon Slack channel and somebody made a very derogatory comment about like Windows developers aren't real developers and a bunch of people gave it a thumbs up. And like, that's not a welcoming community. Um, and so you know, it's something that needs to change. Yeah, so the, so the comment was, you know, there's no adoption or communication. And yeah, it's, it's a lot like, um, I'll keep making, you know, comparisons to DevOps. It's like with DevOps, a lot of enterprises today treat that as um, ops by a different name, right? Like, oh, you're not, we're now doing DevOps because, you know, our ops people um, are writing some config management scripts, right? And not, we've changed the organizational structure to improve collaboration. Um, it's, it's the same thing with Windows where, you know, and it's, it's such a different world for a lot of us, but things like um, a shared Docker experience will bring those worlds closer together so that you can have a conversation. Like right now, it's, there's hardly even grounds for a conversation between, you know, a Linux or a Mac-based developer and a Windows developer because they're like, how do we even, like, you're talking about, um, you know, web servers and technology stacks that I have no comparison point to. And like you love Visual Studio and I use Vim and you know, there's just like all the way up and down the stack, there's very little um, you know, shared empathy, right? And things like um, the same technologies working in both of those worlds are gonna be one of the ways to bridge that divide. One other thing I'd add is, uh, again, as he was saying, this whole thing has just barely started. Um, when I've talked to uh, current and ex-Microsofties myself, one of the impressions that I get is that they have wanted for a very, very long time to do the things that they're currently doing now with open source 
you know, within reason. There's, there is, we're not likely to see, open, you know, an open source Windows anytime soon, if ever. And frankly, I don't know that we need one. But they've been wanting to do things like put together, you know, Windows subsystem for Linux, and they were held back because the general direction of the company didn't permit it. But now there's more of a sense that this is this is essential to their survival and their future. And the people who've been have been dipping their toe into that water have been really excited at, at how welcoming it is. So it's the, the ball has really only just started to roll. Um, but I think you know even just within the next two years things are are going to be you know a lot more welcoming at least at the very least for any Linux people who want to look into what the Windows side has to offer. Uh, I can't speak to the reverse, but I'm certainly hoping it'll open up. Do we have it? Uh, for some of the publications that I write for, it's usually a matter of um, religion because there's still a lot of animosity. Uh, it wasn't all that long ago when Steve Ballmer said Linux is a cancer, and I know you know Microsoft loves Linux today. It wasn't all that long ago when Microsoft claimed that open source software infringed on 233 Microsoft patents, which, by the way, they have never rescinded. Microsoft today earns uh, many... Uh, dollars from uh, licensing agreements for alleged open source patent infringement. So for people that are um, uh, ha see open source as a religion almost, uh, that's what you see in the Slack channel, there's still a tremendous amount of animosity. I think that will fade over time because this is still only a year or two years into the new era of, of uh, Microsoft. But longer term, old school Linux developers, open source types have long memories. Uh, and they don't forget. So that's where some of that comes from. Do we have a question? Yeah. Um, how would the panel see the competitive landscape developing for Docker? So Docker has been first to the table. Obviously, the de facto standard, as you mentioned, there's a big ecosystem developing around it. But are there other uh, competitors coming up there? And if and when might they actually um, play a part in that core technology, not just the stuff around it, but the core container technology? For, for me, because I've got the mic, sorry. Uh, and because you said the word core, so you, you made it really easy for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. So you answered your own question. The only uh, primary competitor I see is CoreOS because uh, they have their own container runtime engine called Rocket, uh, which is also a Cloud Native Computing Foundation project uh, directly adjacent to Container D, uh, roughly equivalent, based on the same uh, OCI uh, runtime container standard. So that's kind of there. Uh, and then Kubernetes on the orchestration side. That's in c the container space itself. I think uh, there is the potential for some uh, things that people haven't uh, heard about yet, whether it's in the server space or otherwise, that will eventually replace containers. Because the, the challenge with everything over time, whether it's Java or now containers, is bloat. Uh, at some point, there's going to be too much. And somebody's going to say, well, there's some other thing thinner architecture, like Tomcat versus Javi. I don't know what that next thing is. I have no doubt in my mind that somebody at MIT or Stanford is pitching a VC on Sand Hill Road about it today, though. Um, so I, I kind of look at this from a different perspective because I follow PaaS. Um, from, so from that perspective, I, I look at the, the leading PaaS players like IBM Bluemix and Red Hat OpenShift and Oh, SAP Cloud Platform, et cetera. Um, from that perspective, yeah, they're, um, they're building out their services. PaaS has finally taken off the way they've wanted it to for years. Um, and, it, and it's about building out the services from containers and microservices to serverless. You know, IBM would be OpenWhisk or, you know, Lambda, Amazon, things like that, to Watson and analytics and having all that together. So. Yeah, it, it's it's very competitive as being one of those important PaaS services. Uh, you know, Red Hat really pushed this notion two or three years ago with OpenShift being you know containers. So, uh, coming from that perspective, uh, definitely it's it's a key it's a key. Um, so, from in my mind, from the PaaS perspective, and one other thing to quickly add, they're also able to support these kind of new initiatives, as in digital transformations, with their large professional groups, or if you're Salesforce with your trailhead training groups. These these groups are getting a lot of traction because a lot of people still don't know how to do these things, um, how how to access these kinds of technology. Um, so that's important too that those companies can back up those professional groups. Uh, from my perspective, you know, I think you made a great point with, with Paz um, in that most of the competitors are going to come out of different pockets rather than competing directly with Docker. They're going to come out of geographic pockets, um, different vertical type pockets, and um, 
you know, different kinds of use cases than you're seeing today. So like Pivotal comes to mind as something that's absolutely a competitor to Docker, but people don't think about it that way, right? Because they don't talk about it that way. They don't talk about, oh, by the way, you know, we run containers inside of our PaaS, or sorry, our cloud platform. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we don't talk about the containers really, right? We focus on things like uh, the spring on top, right? The developer productivity, or the overall operational experience with Bosch, or whatever it happens to be. Um, or and you've got people building on top of that, right? Like SAP, um, like Siemens, right? Like Bosch, all kinds of crazy industrial internet type use cases. Um, and then you've got companies like like Huawei, right? That's doing all kinds of stuff with containers, but it's all over in China and nobody's paying attention to it. And so to me, that's, you know, a lot of the new viable competitors um, will come from places where they can kind of grow silently without affecting Docker itself, and then the, they could burst onto the scene later on. We're also at kind of a weird spot right now where almost all of the key underlying technologies, they were all open source to begin with, but now they're all gradually being moved away from their parent companies and they're being overseen by, you know, allegedly, you know, neutral groups where you have a lot of different people all, you know, contributing and uh, voting in on the direction of things. And I think that means that there's going to be that much less incentive to compete on a technological level because, in theory, everybody's sitting at the same table. Um, it's like she said with PaaS, you know, that a lot of the a lot of the real competition is going to come from taking this stuff and adding value to it, and then reselling it to a business audience. And out of that, there could come any number of things that were simply not foreseeable before. Um, but from from everything that I've seen, this the really revolutionary stuff does not tend to come from places like that tends to bubble up from underneath from almost from nowhere. So if there's any further competition, it's it's probably going to be from, like what he said, it's just going to sort of pop out at us from from some lab somewhere and then, uh, you know, basically take everybody, side sideswipe everybody at once. I guess I didn't say it earlier, but I should just reiterate the, um, the serverless point as, you know, another substitute, right, where people might not care that it runs on top of Docker. They might care, right? I mean, certainly if they want support for it, they're going to have to pay somebody for that. Um, there are a lot of different places where those potential replacements are coming from. I think we have a question from that. Gabriel? Uh, sure. Um, do you guys think that we're going to see wide enterprise adoption of container technologies over the next few years? And more importantly, do you think that we will find that this adoption happens before the next big disruption? Um, I guess I'll start since I'm holding the mic at the moment. Um, so we do some pretty broad scale enterprise decision maker surveys and ask them about container adoption on a, on a semi-regular basis. Um, and so far what we've been seeing is about, um, on the order of 15% of enterprises have at least one containerized app in prod. Um, and about a third of that 15%, so like four or 5%, have multiple containerized apps in prod. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's picking up steam, it's picking up steam really fast, even in the enterprise context, right? It's not just like developers say it's cool, which you can, you know, you can make graphs out of Stack Overflow um, discussions and that sort of thing. But um, it, it is absolutely picking up in the enterprise too. And even things um, you know, that sort of integrate with Docker and containers like serverless are, are picking up steam pretty quickly too, right? We're seeing something like 10% of companies um, have started playing with serverless technologies. And, and you know, I fully expect that trend to keep going upwards. Um, there's always questions about, to me, whether it'll plateau at some point. Right? Like we kind of saw PaaS and, and Hadoop all plateau around 20%. Um, and so you know, can it sort of cross the chasm? The uh, perspective I'd add to that is the folks who are not using it, um, the biggest part of the reason why they're not using it is uh, it generally breaks down to, well, we're curious about it and we want to start making use of it because our competitors are making use of it, but we're still not 100% sure how it fits into our existing business plan. Um, and that tells me that it's the business plan that's probably the problem there and not necessarily their, their use of the technology. But I would agree, it's, uh, the, the, the curiosity is there, it's, it's, it's accelerating quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I, I think definitely, um, you know, executives are, are keen on it because it plays into their objective of moving the data center to the cloud, you know, they, they and moving the drain of the data center out. Um, you know, they want to see the data center be a profit center. Um, 
um, versus such an expense. And so for me, it's kind of three things. It's the, um, it's the agility that developers can do all these cool things we're talking about, use microservices, um, support continuous integration. Uh, it's the lower cost. It tends to fall under those cloud technology licensing models, like pay as you go, and that's very attractive. And um, portability, just to be able to push and schedule um, uh, and orchestrate containers out to different cloud scenarios, whether they're on-prem, private, or public, um, hybrid, um, is, is also very attractive. I'll just go half a step to the side, because uh, enterprises are one thing, but then there's uh, vendors, ISVs, people building software, and I do a lot of work with uh, security vendors, and I could say honestly, in the last six months, I have not talked to a single software vendor that wasn't uh, building a container app for their delivery because it was just easier uh, if they didn't already have one. Uh, and almost every single one of them is also using Go. So there seems to be a, a corresponding relationship, but every single security vendor is going that way. So w enterprises have their legacy apps, et cetera. But uh, on the consumption side, you're going to see a ton. And almost every single software as a service is being re-architected that way because uh, there is real cost efficiencies for doing it. Well, I know we're talking a little bit about microservices, but I think some of the case studies we saw today also dealt with uh, legacy traditional applications. And, and that kind of plays to your enterprise question a little bit. So how do you see that breaking down? You know, as what's the adoption cycle? Uh, I think everybody thought we were going to run immediately towards microservices, but now we're seeing more legacy apps. So how do you see that adoption cycle going? Um. Yeah, so I, I kind of talked through my philosophy on containers at the beginning of this, so I don't need to repeat that. Um, but, you know, in short, uh, as the enterprises start picking this stuff up at scale, they're going to have a lot more requirements, um, like a backup strategy and like PCI compliance. And, um, you know, we actually spent some time talking with a Docker customer about that not too long ago today. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's more or less how I see it playing out, is like all these people come in and you know, things like uh, Chef Inspect, for example, right? Like compliance is code. Um, it applies to the VM world, it applies to the container world. Um, and it's, it's gonna be a lot of it about bridging that divide. And like one, one thing I hear pretty often from enterprises is they don't wanna just add another platform to what they've already got. They don't wanna make things even more complex. Um, they're looking for um, sort of something more like a unified platform that can support the modern stuff, but also the old school stuff. Um, and so, you know, you, you want to have a way to forklift the crap into a container knowing that it's not the greatest environment for it but then thinking okay this is less operational overhead and i'll be able to gradually migrate some of it over time i was just talking with uh, microsoft yesterday about that very issue um, they outlined scenarios where a company will take an existing legacy app typically a, a .NET app but sometimes even as far back as vb6 and they'll stick it in a container and the advantages that they will get from this uh, not only involve portability, but also involve allowing uh, the devs to slowly, you know, sort of peel it apart piece by piece to figure out what bits of it can can be preserved as core, what bits of it can be spun off as as separate microservices, and to do that in its own time and at its own pace while keeping it running. You know. And I thought that's a you know that's a that's a great example of how this stuff is is able to you know preserve this stuff without having to throw everything out and start all over. You mentioned forklifting into it, and I said you know once you get it in there, um, that's a good place to start. But you don't want to leave it in there forever. Eventually, you do want to find a way to take it apart piece by piece, and this provides a beautiful environment for doing that. I, just as a time check, we have three minutes. I'm yeah, sorry. I guess we have <laughs> a really last, quickly. So yeah, yeah. I'll just, I'll just a last little question. The quick, the quick historical note, though, because uh, containers are not new, as everybody here knows. Uh, IBM will tell us they've been around 50 years. But in the past life, I used to run Solaris systems. There's probably a few people here probably have in the past, too. Uh, but Solaris has zones. Whenever you moved up from Solaris, uh, you would run a Solaris 6 container, a Solaris 6 zone on Solaris 8, et cetera, et cetera. So at one point, I had a Solaris 10 system with running Solaris 6, 7, 8, and 9 in a 10. So in that old world, people used to do that, but that was the single vendor infrastructure. So people that grew up in that world, you know, they can just move the same way. It's the same thing. You just move things up. All right. Last question. Hi. Hi. Uh, how do you see the container technology compared to OpenStack? Is it kind of a competitor, or how do you see them? It's uh, OpenStack, if you think of it as uh, OpenStack Nova, so we'll just because OpenStack is a collection of services, OpenStack Nova is the compute thing. Compute could be a virtual machine, Zen, Hyper-V, uh, KVM, Zen, or 
Um, or it could be a container, though they don't do it as the Docker Nova driver, they deprecated that, but it's just another module of compute that fits in. You have to think of OpenStack as a set of projects that provide identity storage, access control, networking, uh, and then probably 20 other incremental things. Um, and containers are just a, uh, if you think of it just as a compute model that fits in, they have a pro they have multiple projects. There's uh, OpenStack Magnum, which you could plug multiple orchestrators in. There's something called OpenStack Zune, which you could also run a Docker engine inside of. So it's, it's not an either or, it's just something that plugs in. I would just add to that that, um, you know, as of now, you still need virtualization to run containers. You know, you need a VM to, to bring a large app into the cloud. That's that's just the case now. It's not going to be feasible to, to have it that way long term, though. Um, it's not a viable way to, to manage the data center or to um, provision applications. And, and it's also not really feasible for developers to have to jump through some of those extra hoops using Chef or... or um, other technologies um, to uh, to build applications, you know, on VMs. I think we might have time for one more comment. So Donnie and Sir, I'll let you flip a coin there. All right. I'll, I'll make a quick one, and then Sir can make one more if he wants to. All right. um, so I've been tracking the OpenStack community for a long time too, and I think the the shift that's starting to happen is it used to be seen as either or, right? Like you can kind of go the container orchestration management route, and that's somehow a replacement for a full OpenStack cloud with all the other stuff, um, without getting too deep into that. What's really interesting that's starting to happen now is the idea of post-Nova OpenStack clouds, right? Where they completely rip and replace that with something else. And you know, when you think about like OpenStack traditionally, like Nova was the, the core of your OpenStack cloud. And now it's something you can leave out and say, you know what, we're gonna go um, do something else that's, that's solely focused on containers instead. And um, there's actually some case studies that have come out focused on that that are definitely worth checking out. The really cynical answer that I've heard is that you know OpenStack provided one set of, of uh, answers to how a lot of this stuff can be done, and containers provided a really nice, focused, much less overhead, much less to memorize, much less to tinker with solution. And you know, so there's a difference between everything in the world versus just the one thing that you need. That's the cynical answer. <laughs> All right. On that note, uh, thank you guys, uh, Sirdar, Donnie, Charlotte, Sean. Thank you, and thanks everyone for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Um, just a quick note before you leave, please don't forget to upvote this nice presentation in your DockerCon application.